it is composed of eight bits. So let's see how you guys are at your math. How many different possible bytes are there if a byte is, contained, is composed of eight bits and each bit has two choices, on or off? Then we'd only have 16 letters in our alphabet. Anybody? Want to take a guess? It's eight, eight times, 64. So, so we have a 16, we have a 64. Any, anyone else? 56. It's, think about what it is. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters, each one of these, ca each one of these little bits can have a zero or a one, right? So it is two to the eighth power. Two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. So the correct answer is 256 different bytes. That's more than enough in the um, English language to handle all of our letters, all of our numbers, all of our symbols. And in fact, we only really use the first seven. This last thing is kind of a check digit, a check bit to make sure everything else is okay. Um, so that's great. It's a little bit more troublesome in the Chinese language where there are a lot far more characters than we have in English. So that's a byte. It's eight bits. And it's the equivalent of a letter, if you would, or a number. A bunch of bytes make up a field. So let's say you worked for a company. Your address field would be 40 bytes. Which would be all the possible um, letters that make up your address, or your street address. or could be your last name, as I have here in this example. Maybe 20 bytes for your last name. A record is a collection of fields. So you have the first line of your address, you have your city and your state, your zip code. Each one of those is a field. Combined, they make up a record could be your employee record with your name and social security number, et cetera. So we're going from the smallest unit, working our way up. A file is a collection of records. So it's your employee information and your employee information and your employee information all together is a file. And finally, a database, the big one. It's all the files. So it's the employee database base plus the, the employee file plus the customer file plus the um, tax status file. Whatever your, all your files are that make up your database, they all come together, different files, to create a single database. And the way those files interact with each other are very important. So this is your hierarchy of data from the smallest unit to the largest. So I more or less talked about this, but a record has a series of fields. Some fields might be defined as numeric because you do, you do calculations on them, like an hourly pay rate, because multiply that by the number of hours you worked, and that'll tell you how much somebody should get paid. Some of them can have anything in it, like a name field, can have letters or numbers or characters or whatever else is appropriate. Some of them are defined as a key, a record key, and we'll talk about it, that in a second. A key is something that identifies a given record uniquely. 
So if you have a social security number, it's not quite unique, but it's pretty close to unique. Right, how many digits is a social security number? Four, three, four, two? Three, two, four? Nine. Well, we've actually, over the course of time, repeated social security numbers. So they're not truly unique, but they're close to unique. So that's a record layout. Now I talked about the field formats. You can have alpha, you can have numeric, but you can have more than those as well. So here are some different types of formats. Numeric, alpha, those are the two we talked about. You can store it as a currency. So it's not only numeric, but it's a currency field. A field could be stored as a date or time. So when you put it in, it knows it to be a date or time. Boolean. A Boolean field is kind of like a bit in that it only has two choices, yes or no. So a field that's defined as a Boolean field is only given the choice of being a yes or a no. A counter is a numeric field that just increments by one for every new record. And a blob is how you store pictures and graphics. So fields take on some unique characteristics depending upon what their purpose is. And as you work with Microsoft Access later on in the semester, you'll understand why setting these fields up in the right way will simplify what you're doing. Records. A record is unique based upon its primary key. For a given customer file or a given, let's say, employee file, you can only have one instance for a given primary key. You can't have, so if you have two employees with the same social security number, the system will break down. Quite often, we don't use social security number as a primary identifier because of that very, very small possibility. You just give a customer number or an employee number. You create an employee number. You have a student number here at Rutgers. That's just created some sequential manner to make sure it's unique. So the primary key is extraordinarily important as a way to uniquely identify a given record. A composite key, also called a concatenated key, I think one text calls it composite, the other calls it concatenated. I tend to call it concatenated. It's the exact same thing. Is if, if you don't have a single primary key that could be unique, you may need to take two fields and combine them together. So you take the social security number and the last name. The likelihood of there being two of the exact same there is really small, and, you know, beyond possibility. So a concatenated key is the combination of two fields that together, or more, could be three or four fields, that together comprise the primary key. A foreign key, I will mention it here, but it won't make that much sense, trust me, until we actually see it in action. It's very, very important. Um, but a foreign key, um, the purpose of that is to point one record to another record. So it's a pointer, let's say, from an employee to a sale or from a customer to a sale or for a piece of inventory to a warehouse. It points from one record to another. And we'll see that in action a lot in this class. Um, it may not make too much sense today. It's not supposed to. A secondary key is something we don't use very much in this class. How many of you use Microsoft Excel? And maybe, you know, you, you, you sort your, maybe I sort my Microsoft, Microsoft Excel 
um, for this class, I, je I usually sort it by last name then first name. So that's, ki that's kind of the primary key for my Excel file in this class. The secondary key might be for me to sort it by team. It's a different way to sort, to, to arrange the data for you to see. That is a secondary key of lesser importance for what we're doing, but it's still something you should understand. And then non-key attributes are all those fields that we don't think about as keys. So your, the state you live in, your zip code, they're just fields on the record that are not part of the key, primary or foreign. Okay, so those are record keys. Coding systems, coding systems. These have to do with your keys, right? How do you define your key? Do you make it a sequential number? Do you make it meaningful in some way? There are different types of coding systems. Mnemonic systems. What do these mean? Small, medium, large, extra large. Mnemonic codes are codes that you can just look at and you can figure out what they're talking about. Okay? They're generally letters rather than numbers, and they, they're fairly clear just by looking at them. So you might use them for clothing. A sequence code is just a number that gets incremented, like the customer number that I talked about, or the employee number. Or if you have a checkbook, your checks are sequential numbers. So quite often, it's very useful to have sequence numbers, like in a checkbook, because if you're balancing your checkbook, you want to know if you're missing one of them. So sequence numbers are useful in a different kind of way than mnemonic codes. Block codes are how charts of accounts are set up. In case any of you have seen a chart of account, you should, if you haven't already, as accountants. Um, we'll look at one of these in a moment, so I'll come back to this. And then group codes are mnemonic codes plus. So it could be a group code might say, Style one, two, three, extra large, green. So you have three different segments to this code, each one with a different purpose. All to go, you know, it has two mnemonic components. There's really no way to make the style mnemonic, although you could have groups within style. You have all your bell bottoms as a one, and whatever you're going to do there. You guys know what a bell bottom is, right? You've, they were really big in the 70s. And then came back. So that would be a group code. Chart of accounts. Chart of accounts tend to be set up in blocks. So you give 100 accounts, let's say, for current assets and 100 accounts for non-current assets, etc. You may or may not need all of them. And then you, within that, break it down. Maybe 100 is cash, 110, which is all part of current assets, is marketable securities. 120 being common stock, 121 preferred stock, etc. So you could break it down that way, and then when you're done with all of your marketable securities, then you might have 130 prepaid expenses, 140 inventory, et cetera. So you break it down in logical ways, leaving room so you can have subsets of inventory if you so need it. Okay, let's do a little um, block coding problem. 
Let's assume that Rutgers would like to devise a coding scheme for which it can identify students. Students can be one of three things. You can be in-state, out-of-state, or international. You can also be either an undergrad or a graduate student. All total, let's say, I'm sure it's not bigger than this, Rutgers has 10,000 students. You might have more than 1,000 students in a category. But you'll never have more than 4,000 students in a, in a category, a subcategory. So you'll never have more than 4,000 students that would be an in-state undergraduate or international graduate. Okay, work with your teammates and devise a block coding schema. Devise a block coding schema. Remember, the block coding schema is kind of like a chart of accounts. You have to be able to handle between 1,000 and 4,000 students within each of these subcategories. Boom, 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 boom. So how many characters do you need to give to handle that many students? Four, right? Because you have to be able to handle up to 4,000 or 9999 would handle up to 4,000. So this is a good coding scheme. It's actually more advanced than you need to for the purpose of this question, but it would work just fine. Right? It's not quite a group coding scheme, because in the purest sense, what a group coding scheme would say, 1 through 4,000 would be considered undergraduate out of state, or 4,001 to 8,000 could be um, undergraduate in state, 8,001 to 12,000 would be undergraduate international, 12,001 to 16,000 would be graduate out of state and then so in fact you could do this with just five characters right because you have to be able to handle 12,000 16,000 and 1 to 20,000 and then 20,000 and 1 to 24,000 and that would be a block coding scheme uh, that would be the simplest block coding scheme. Yours is a bit more descriptive than that. This coding scheme here, so you could have anywhere between 'Cause you've taken characters up front to say undergraduate out of state, you know you can have a maximum of four thousand. So UOS zero 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 one through UOS uh, four zero 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 can cover all of your students. Undergraduate in state zero 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 three is the third student within that subcategory. In this situation here, you have a lot of just sequential numbers that doesn't give you any information except you, you have kind of a key somewhere else that says the first 4,000 students are going to be under, undergraduate out of state. The next 4,000 set aside now are going to be undergraduate in state. You may not use all 4,000 of these, right? You only have 1,000. So you may only have 0001 through 1,000 here. You didn't use any of the others. It still starts the undergraduate in-state at 4,001. You set aside 4,000 for your worst case scenario. You need to set it aside for the worst case scenario right there. 
okay, within subcategory. And that's how group coding works. Not the most effective coding scheme, to be honest, but good for charts of accounts. Here is more of what we did over here. The first digit defines whether you're in state or out of state. It's just kind of opposite to what you did here. Can we change the U to G to one or two? Yeah, U and G are one or two. So we're not doing mnemonics here, that's the thing. We're just using values, not mnemonics. And then we're using digit positions three, four, five, and six, four digits to have a specific number. And since we know there are no more than 4,000 within a category, this will be fine. So if you see this and it says student 120875, what does that mean? So it's an in-state graduate student number 875. Okay? Better, more descriptive than this, but maybe not as strong as it could be. What's this? OG0875. Using mnemonics here, out of state graduate student number 875. So when we think about primary keys on our records, some type of coding scheme that uniquely identifies the primary key <coughs> needs to be implemented. Sometimes it's sequential, sometimes it's block, sometimes it's group, sometimes it's mnemonic. Different types of coding schemes. File types. File types. To be honest, many of these file types were more relevant in the world of um, non-relational databases. In the world of relational databases, it, it's done a little bit differently. But it's important for you to understand these. A master file is relatively impermanent information. An employee record would be a, an employee master file. Um, a customer record would be a customer master file. They're fairly permanent. You know, they don't change very often. You know, if you're an employee and you get a raise, you have to change the amount of your hourly rate for your raise. So a master file will change from time to time but on a daily basis, it doesn't change that frequently. A transaction file, on the other hand, is every day's transactions. At the end of the day, Amazon is updating all their transactions if they don't do it in real time, and updating their master files to reflect all the transactions they did in the course of a given day. So the transaction files are what happens in the course of time. A reference table changes even less frequently than a master file. The table of all zip codes in the United States does, isn't going to change very often, if, you know, if ever. That would be a reference table. You know, the tax code doesn't change very often. A history file is just once a transaction has been processed, it goes to a history file, it gets put on tape, let's say, a, a more permanent storage medium, and shipped into the mountains of Utah to be shielded from nuclear attack. As are backup files of your master files. So. Even in today's day and age where we have real-time processing, data is still stored on tapes and shipped off-site for protective purposes. 
both history and backup files. So there are two types of file organizations and two types of processing modes, and they kind of go together. Sequential and batch processing go together, and random access and online processing. Let's do the random access and online processing first. I'm on Amazon, and I see a backpack I want to buy. For me to access the information about that backpack, I don't know why I came up with that example, but it's what came in my head. Um, I don't want to go through every single item of inventory that Amazon has, right? You want to, online, real time, point specifically to the specific item that you've requested. To do that, it has to do online real-time processing by randomly going to that item. And it's, it's done via pointers. You go in and there's a very small piece of information that says, to find this backpack, go look here on our database. And it will go physically look over there on a database to, to get that piece of information. So online real-time processing goes with random access to the data. Batch processing goes with sequential access. So batch processing is, you know, once a month a company pays its payroll. It's not going to say, let's pay Joe here, let's pay, pay Susie here. It's going to say, here are all of our employees, let's sort them by employee number, and go pay them, one after the other, after the other, after the other by some relevant sort sequence. So it works sequentially through every single employee and processes all of them. So sequential processing occurs in batch mode and random with online. Relational databases store information so that they can be accessed randomly. That's what we do. This picture, which came out of the text, so get to look at. Whether you're online or batch, this is relatively similar. Although in online, this is all done in one step. So data is somehow input. You could type it in at your computer. It's somehow prepared um, validation testing, make sure that the data you put in is correct and relevant. In online processing, this all happens simultaneously. In batch processing, it might happen while the batch is being run overnight. So the data is input during the day, and then overnight it prepares it. And once it's successfully gotten through the data preparation, it's processed. Maybe multiplication is done, you know, all kind of mathematical manipulations are done. Um, maybe additional information is added to it, et cetera. And then something comes out for another purpose, whether it's a report or updates to the data or it produces a check so you get paid at night if it's batch processing of payroll. And it goes and looks at where appropriate, your master files to get information from. Master and reference files. Notice these symbols. You're going to get to learn how to work with symbols like this. This is just another way to look at batch processing. You have a transaction file that's sorted in the appropriate way, maybe by employee number, and edited. And if there are bad transactions, you kick them out so that they don't get processed. You then take that sorted and edited file, and you do something with it. Maybe you're cutting checks or whatever you're doing. And you produce your outputs, and you create an error listing 
um, for the purposes of understanding ones that didn't happen right. And you would also potentially be updating your master files with new information that might come. Maybe there's information on the master file for an employee. How much have they earned year to date? So as you cut this new check, you would update their year to date earnings on the master file. That's batch processing. Online, which is what you're all used to, as the transaction occurs, whether by an employee of the company or more and more likely these days, by the customer themselves, it's great, you know, Amazon has a good gig. We do their data entry for them. We enter it, they have um, robots picking it in the warehouse and not touching any human hands the entire way through. So they have a nice efficient process so as it occurs, the transaction is processed, everything occurs here, and it might go onto tape for storage purposes so they have a backup. But this is really what's happening online. So as, you, as I bought that backpack, it creates the transaction for that backpack to be sent by me, sent to me, excuse me, and it also updates the master file and says, we now have one less backpack to sell. Do we need to order more? The control environment. So you, you do this processing. Um, you need to control your computer systems, both for, for illegal reasons and also just because mistakes happen. Erroneous input, erroneous processing. Erroneous processing is usually because you had a programmer who didn't quite get it right. Erroneous input is because the more times you have human hands on a process, the more likely those human hands are going to make a mistake. We're going to type something in wrong. So as you have your control environment, you want to limit the number of potential error points in your process. Computer fraud. We'll have an entire day to talk about fraud. Um, people can try to steal. You need to have controls in place to ensure that your employees or outside people don't find a weakness in your system and try to steal from you. <coughs> Security breaches related to fraud, hackers, you need to have all the proper controls in place to hopefully prevent hacking. Unfortunately, hackers are very clever. No matter what controls you put in place, they're constantly moving, moving at the mark. And so your challenge is to stay close to them. Hardware and software fa failures. You know, hardware is what it is. It breaks down. You know, we have our iPhones that break down. We have our computers that break down. So do big companies. They ne need to have some sense of fault tolerance. Some sense that if a computer breaks down, they're going to still be in business. If an online company like Amazon if their computer breaks down and they don't have some kind of fault tolerance, they're out of business until they fix it. So they need to figure out ways to um, stay in business even when there is a problem. And finally, natural disasters. Back with Hurricane Sandy, there was the hospital down in um, lower Manhattan that had some fault tolerance. So when their systems went down, they had you know, a secondary system ready to go. But what was their mistake? It was, it was in the basement. It got flooded and they were, so they, they, you need to handle the possible fault, natural disasters that may occur. So quite often, companies have a data center here in New York because it's quicker. And then we'll have a secondary data center somewhere outside of New York so that it's on a different electrical grid and a different maybe, um, um, weather pattern so that, God forbid, something happens, they could stay in business. So as you think about your control environment, you need to think about all of those things. And management sets the tone by setting objectives, ensuring that, you know, that it matters to them that these things happen. and ultimately ensuring that everybody understands the importance 
of a strong control environment. I think in today's day and age, with all of the hacking that you're hearing about, everyone gets it. Everyone gets it. Um, some are better than others at protecting themselves. Um, an example of a control environment, don't get caught up in this chart, it doesn't matter. It says that within a given processing system, you might have a subsystem whose only purpose is to monitor that processing system and identify an unusual transaction. And if something unusual were to happen, real time, it'll kick out and tell the appropriate people that, hey, this is a weird transaction. We need to look at it. So you actually have shadow systems watching the primary system to make sure that um, any problems are identified. Okay, so every year the AICPA comes out with what it's found to be the top 10 initiatives that IT was going to focus on. Unfortunately, they didn't come out with their 2014 version yet, so I didn't have the most recent one. But in 2013, a year ago, their number one thing was data, right? That was like two, a year ago or so was when big data was really everywhere. Data, 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 big data. How do we manage our data and use that as a competitive advantage? And so that was the number one um, initiative for 2013. Number two was security. I'll bet you that when 2014 comes out, security will be number one, based upon all of the occurrences this past year, whether it's Sony or whatever else the ability to hack and the challenges that hacking can cause will definitely make security number one going forward. Then there are the other ones, and you know, of these 10, from year to year, seven of them stay the same. The order might change, but they're more or less the same. You know, managing systems implementations, that's you know, big computer systems, how do you get them in so they work the first time when they go in? We'll talk about that. Etc. So all of these occur, these two in today's day and age are the most important.